Hi everyone, welcome to Science Lab. The signs are happening because Jesus is coming. Every day we are looking at some of the great signs that are happening around us. Today we are going to look at the, some of the technological advancements in these last days. What will our cities look like in 100 years? Our cities have a major impact on how we live our lives. Traffic, housing, infrastructure, all of these play a role in our day to day. With urban technologies advancing at breakneck speed, what will our cities look like in the future? Perhaps the most important aspect to consider in designing a city is the threat of natural disaster. Cities on fault lines, for example, have different construction codes from those built in hurricane areas. As global temperatures continue to rise and heat records are broken every year, melting ice at the poles will lead to rising sea levels. We could very easily see ice-free Arctic summers within our lifetimes. If we fail to address the problem, we'll have to change how our cities are built. One rather extreme solution is the creation of floating cities. Some companies and governments are putting together plans to create a large livable areas which float on the surface of the ocean. In 2017, French Polynesia made a deal to allow the Sea Studying Institute to explore the first steps in constructing a floating city. This would address the problem of rising oceans and eroding coastlines. One of the hopes in creating floating cities is that they would exist in international waters and be able to govern themselves better. Similar to floating cities are underwater cities. Japan construction firm Shimizu Corp has released plans to deploy a $26 billion underwater city called Ocean Spiral by 2030. It would house several thousand people and draw its energy from the seabed and ocean currents. Plans for this city include residential and business zones. It would contain many of the necessities humans require to live. The project is backed by the Japanese government and Tokyo University. Then again, maybe underground cities would suit us better. We already have buildings with large underground spaces and subways are common in cities throughout the globe. So it wouldn't be too much of a stretch for humans to develop more extensive underground dwellings, potentially powering them using geothermal energy sources. In the past, underground living areas been developed in emergency situations, such as when the Vietnamese built the 75 mile long Ku Chi tunnels during the Vietnam War. They included sleeping quarters, recreational areas and medical sections. Wherever we build in the future, technology will be revolutionize our urban environments. Wi-Fi is becoming more and more pervasive and cities of the future could become connected in more ways than we can imagine. Once cities embrace being connected, we could have amazing reception everywhere we go. This would also mean that advertisers might connect to you as well. When you drive past that billboard on your way to work, it might know you're passing and display a product you'd be especially interested in. Speaking of driving to work, we might soon live in a world where self-driving cars and transportation systems are common. This would make navigating cities easier than ever and allow goods and produce to be transported more efficiently over long distance. The only problem would be fuel due to limited oil reserves and climate change. At some point, we'll have to switch from gasoline to electricity and from coal to renewable energy sources. On the plus side, a city redesigned to take advantage of renewable energies could provide a grid that allows self-driving cars to recharge easily. The rise of autonomous and electric vehicles will create a big change in how we design and build our cities. When horse-drawn carriages gave way to automobiles, roads changed from dirt to pavement. We may see similarly dramatic changes with the advent of electric self-driving cars. All these new technologies and structures will require some serious natural resources. However, extracting them from the earth often comes at great environmental cost. Several countries and companies are exploring ways to harvest the rich natural minerals within asteroids and other space objects. One trip from the local asteroid mine could yield amazing amounts of precious metals. These materials could then be used to build the smart houses of the future. These homes would be connected to the internet in all kinds of unique ways. Maybe your alarm clock will tell appliances in your kitchen to start preparing breakfast or your car to warm up automatically. The modern world is more connected than ever, but 
we all run into cell and Wi-Fi reception from time to time. In the future, satellites will continue to improve, making communication faster and more reliable. All this high-speed access could mean that many jobs can be performed from home. We can already phone into meetings halfway across the globe. But virtual computing would make it like we were there in person. Teams could meet in virtual spaces without having to travel at all. This means that there would be fewer people on the road and potentially less pollution. On the subject of work, workers of the future might need to work a lot less because of automation and efficiency improvements. At first, this could have a devastating impact on employment, robbing many people of their livelihoods. In the long term, however, people may one day look back at our working culture the way we look back at factory jobs in the industrial revolution. The whole idea of work will have to be re-examined as we come to realize that many of the things we need such as food. The whole idea of work will have to be re-examined as we come to realize that many of the things we need such as food, water and shelter are easily provided thanks to advances in food production and robotics. With more free time, people could develop more communal areas for their cities. These spaces could provide many basic services for the population and serve as a way for people to feel more connected in an otherwise disconnected world. If floating, underground and autonomous cities don't excite you, then how about space cities? If we continue to overpopulate the planet and fail to answer our climate problems, humanity might be forced to move to the stars. Instead of looking out the window and seeing a parking lot or rundown building, you might see the entire earth floating in front of you. Plans are already underway to put people on Mars, so it wouldn't be a stretch to envision cities on the moon or rotating around earth like satellites. The future of our cities depend on a lot of things, but if we can solve some key issues, then they will be some truly exciting places. And now it's time for the trivial question of the day. What was the first message sent through the internet? The options are option A, hello, option B, good morning, and option C, login. Let's find the answer after a short break. Welcome back to Science Lab. The signs are happening because Jesus is coming. Before the break, I asked you the trivial question of the day. What was the first message sent through the internet? And the options given were option A, hello, and option B, good morning, and option C, login. And the correct answer is option C, login. In August 1962, J.C.R. Licklider proposed a new but monumental idea, computers that could talk to one another. A simple idea, but one whose implications resulted in a world-changing network. The first message sent over the internet, which at this time was called the ARPANET, was sent from UCLA to Stanford in 1969. The goal was just to try and find a way to make computing power more efficient. During this time, computers were basically huge machines called mainframes that sat in rooms of buildings doing nothing but handling one task at a time. The ARPNET planned to connect these mainframes to create multiple streams of processing power to improve research. The idea of the internet at this point was for science. The first message sent was login and it worked. The computer at Stanford only received the L and O before the system crashed. But it worked and it changed everything. The shift from newspapers to radio was barely anything when compared from the transition from radio to television. You can now finally see and hear people from parts of the world that you had never seen before. You were finally able to attach a look and a personality to the entertainment you were receiving. Almost immediately, the world became connected in a way that was never before imagined. TV changed the way we entertained ourselves and our families. 
However, the internet as we know it changed the world in ways that make the past 2000 years of work and technological advancement look like baby steps. Take this for example, in 1860, the absolute fastest way to get a piece of mail from one side of the country to other was by horse. Riders could deliver a letter from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California over 2000 miles away in only 10 days. Take that time, double it and you will have your average time it would have taken to get a message across the country and back, almost 3 weeks. Today, however, you could send hundreds of thousands of times that the amount of information to someone in literally a second. But how did we get here? So imagine it's the early 1970s, there's a bunch of these huge computers in multiple places. However, they really can't communicate. There's different software and things that make talking to one another through these networks almost impossible until TCP or IP comes in and this changes everything. It's the foundation of how every computer talks to one another today. TCP IP allows data to be chopped up into what we call packets, sent from one place to another. And regardless of how it gets there, it will display the same information on the other side. Using TCP IP, computers could talk to one another. So this can be considered the beginning of the internet, except it isn't the same internet as we know it today. In the 1970s, most traffic across the internet was just email until Tim Berners-Lee came in. He saw a way of being able to store information and data on the internet. At this time, the internet was just full of basically Google Docs, full of text information. It was boring. But Tim Berners-Lee created something that allowed for people anywhere to share any and all information they had through separate pages with a specific location to be found. If it sounds like a book, it kind of is. Books are like webs of information you can reference certain pages, the chapters, go back and forth all you want whatever. Just like you can now do on the internet. The year is 1991 and Tim Berners-Lee had just created what we know today as the World Wide Web and the connectivity begins to explode. More and more things are being connected to the internet, sure. There's millions of new people each year who gain access to the internet. The things that used to be average items are now being connected to the internet. Every phone sold today has some sort of access to the internet. Smartwatches are now a thing. Refrigerators for some reasons are able to connect to the internet. So are washers and dryers and blenders. It's like do you really need an app for that but regardless it makes life easier in many ways. Every minute, 300 hours of footage is uploaded to YouTube. Over 5 lakh snapshots are seen, 5 lakh Facebook comments posted. Every day, 600 million people used Instagram with over 95 million photos posted. Every year, over $6 billion are spent just maintaining YouTube, the platform that supports hundreds of thousands of people's careers. And this is just one corner of the internet. Every year, the internet gets larger and larger as the amount of information increases drastically. Web traffic is at the highest that's ever been and there's not much of a reason for it to slow down. The internet gives you a way of feeling at home with people from other parts of the world. News has also been affected in a huge way. News spreads much much faster. To be honest, I figure out most of my news on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube before I see it on a traditional source of media. The internet have leveraged the spread of information. Traditional news sources needed time to get the stories out. For example, newspapers who wouldn't get some stories until days or weeks after they occurred depending on the location. 
Today you could first hand views and stories from people who experience these events. Of course, not everything you see online is true and with the internet getting better and better at faking things, it's hard to tell real from fake. In 2013, Facebook decided it wanted to give everyone in the world internet in countries or places that didn't have the internet. Facebook would provide it. Facebook's internet was a bit different. They only allowed access to Facebook as well as certain amount of hand-picked websites that they figured were worthy of access. The thing is when asked these people still said they didn't have access to the internet but they had access to and spent hours and hours on Facebook. For them, it seemed that the internet as we know, it wasn't real, but Facebook was and is the internet. Nigeria was the fastest country to launch 80 pre-selected websites for free with Atel Africa, the country's second largest mobile provider. Facebook was offering Nigerians over 90 million people the opportunity to access news, health information and services are free. It sounds good, but it isn't. Seeing as how big the internet is, there's always someone or something trying to take it away from you. With the recent news about net neutrality votes, your internet use and freedom is at a stack every time. This example with Facebook is exactly what net neutrality isn't. Facebook was choosing specific sites to allow access, but as we know it today, the internet is a seemingly endless pool of weird and cool and confusing things. If there's something you want to find someone, somewhere, on the internet, has it. But with this, it's restricted and that is the beginning of the end of the internet as we know it. People complain and say that phones and computers and the internet has ruined us that we don't actually talk to one another anymore. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Anytime you see someone on their phone in public, there's an extremely high chance that all they were doing is connecting with other people. Text messages, Twitter, email, YouTube, we talk now more than ever and much more louder. The internet has literally almost connected you to any person you couldn't think of. It takes only 3 to 4 people to connect you to any other person on the planet. Me, celebrities, the president and YouTuber or streamer. Just 3 to 4 of the right people separate you from them. Freedom of speech and anonymity go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. The internet gives people a place to express their real thoughts without fear of peer pressure or fear of being persecuted for saying the wrong thing. This has let people's true colors show and it's not always sunshine and rainbows on the internet. Just like when television became popular, things that were previously never before seen now had light being shed on them. Take the Vietnam War for example. People could finally see the terrors of wars and what was being done. It made things real and that changed a lot. If we want something like the internet to work, something on that big of a scale, we have to leave it open to everyone, non-restricted. It's made us the most efficient we have ever been but also made us the laziest we have ever been. Of course, with being connected to every person in the world, it comes with its downsides. Every day you see tons of people who put on a show for social media. Seeing Instagram and other sites is highlight real and that very bad. Here's why. The internet has given everyone a voice and now the majority of people use it to show off what they spent their last paycheck on. This has unfortunately given a false image of success to many people. With all the good opportunities that the internet provides us, there's more people obsessed. With all the good opportunities that the internet provides, there's more people obsessed with looking successful as obsessed to actually being successful. This is a good thing actually, it exposes the people who fake it while promoting the people who succeed. Just as civilization did tens of thousands of years ago, communities form. You form groups with like-minded people. But it's not all bad, the internet has given us connectivity. Online shopping, research, social media, cloud storage, cultural exposure, viral content, just instant information about anything. There's so much stuff on the internet, most of it you don't even know exists. The more you use, the better you understand the impact it has. If you want something, whether it be a service or product, legal or illegal, immoral or unethical, the internet has it. You can choose to use this for good or bad.
In just over 50 years, the internet went from being an idea as part in someone's mind to completely dominating our cities as it is today. As of June 2018, 55.5% of the world's population has internet access and this number is growing each year by hundreds of millions of people. The internet has gone from huge clunky machines that could hardly handle a basic message to small devices that you can wear on your wrist or fit in your pocket. The speeds at which we communicate are speeding up by only question is what could possibly come next. In the book of Revelation chapter 13 verse 16 and 17 says, The Antichrist will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. How will he know that who has a mark or who hasn't? It's through internet. All these show that what is mentioned in the Bible that are going to take place in the end times are taking place in our lifetime. We are living in the last days. Lord Jesus Christ is coming again very soon. Thank you for watching this episode. Don't forget to tune into Science Lab next time. Send us photos, videos, news and YouTube links which are worth sharing and also send us your feedbacks to our email address sciencelab at angeltv.org. If you have missed any of the episodes, don't worry, you can watch it again and again in our Science Lab YouTube page. But don't forget to like, share and comment on the video. Ask your friends and relatives to watch the Science Lab so that they will know that we are living in the last days. Remember, signs are happening because Jesus is coming. Maranatha. Maranatha.